Welcome everyone. University of Illinois Extension is happy to host this Rural Partners webinar series. Uh, the series is called Hemp and Cannabis in the Prairie State. Um, last August, on August 8th, we had a first portion of the webinar series on production perspectives and challenges. Um, and then in September, we had on the um, state of Illinois, um, the uh, Dave Lakeman, he uh, spoke about the state of cannabis and hemp policy in Illinois and also across the country and how that policy has sort of evolved and progressed and answered a lot of questions about that. Um, and then today we are going to um, focus on the costs and benefits of recreational cannabis legalization in Illinois. This is a county level analysis and um, this will you know, talk about uh, marijuana tax revenues um, and give those estimates for Illinois counties. So we're really happy um, to have on uh, Dr. Atayman. I would be remiss not to say that um, aside from Rural Partners being our co-host for this series, that Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs really is a great partner all the time in so many avenues of development in Illinois with so many of our great states organizations and institutions and in working with communities, but also as a partner today for this program because we have Dr. Atayman who's from the Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs. And before his presentation, I also wanna welcome uh, the director of Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs, Chris Merritt on for brief remarks. And I'm gonna ask him to switch hats as a board member of, um, also of Rural Partners. Um, maybe he can wear all those hats at the same time, but Chris, thank you so much for being with us and moderating this final webinar in the series. And we look forward to the program and I'll pass it to you. Great. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, as Nancy said, uh, I am the director of the Institute, but I've, I've been a board member of Rural Partners uh, since 2005. And I've also served as the chair of the board of directors. And so, um, it's, it's really my great pleasure to uh, promote rural partners and to also say thanks to U of I Extension, which, which does an, an excellent job uh, delivering these webinars on a range of topics. And with this partnership with rural partners, we have a specific focus on rural development. And I, I think it's just really great. I learn a lot. And so thanks to Nancy and U of I Extension. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague. Uh, uh, D is a professor in the Institute for Rural Affairs. He brings a marketing background as a faculty member, a prolific researcher, a prolific grant writer. And uh, you can see um, many of his publications are available on the Institute for Rural Affairs website. Um, including other um, publications related to hemp cannabis, but also mental health, uh, Dollar General stores, and a whole range of topics. And today, Adi will be talking about marijuana tax revenues estimates for Illinois counties. And, and without further ado, I hand it over to Adi. Thank you, Chris. Um, and again, um, thanks, Nancy, for hosting us. Um, uh, again, um, Please feel free to ask questions, uh, even if it's in the middle of the presentation, I'm uh, happy to answer them. Um, this presentation is very much to do with, um, uh, you know, the legalizing the recreational cannabis in Illinois. And um, I'm gonna talk about the costs and benefits of um, um, recreational cannabis for counties. So, you know, for example, um, do they really benefit in terms of tax revenues or, uh, you know, is there any other issue that has to be addressed before they can reap the full benefit of uh, uh, the recreational cannabis and so on. Uh, and again, um, the papers, um, you know, I have plenty of um, papers on the topic and um, I have used three uh, papers uh, to uh, construct this presentation. Um, and again, when you get the slides, all you have to do is, um, you know, click and download the PDF version of uh, those papers. And if you have any questions, you can email me, you know, in terms of data, in terms of, um, you know, estimates, how I came up with uh, the estimating equation and so on. I'll be happy to uh, uh, answer them. Um, and again, um, thanks, and um, uh, please, um, if you have any questions, uh, stop me in the middle, and I'll be happy to answer. Okay, um, when you think in terms of policy, 
you know, there are two, broadly, there are two facets of policy. One is crafting the policy. And policy, you know, when you think in terms of policy, what we are trying to do, um, most of the time, we are trying to actually maximize the well-being of the population. Um, and so, you know, once the policy is in place, we need to assess how uh, it has benefited the population. So we do policy analysis. And basically, it's, um, you know, assessing the benefits of the policy and uh, uh, looking at the costs of the policy and, you know, and seeing whether uh, the net uh, benefit is there or not. So if you think in terms of recreational uh, cannabis um, in Illinois, you have tax revenues, which would be a benefit. And then you also have costs. So if you put that in a in an equation like what I have uh, shown there, uh, the quotient, the result should be greater than one. If it is not, then the policy is not really adding value. And again, it's a crude measure, but it's an objective measure rather than us subjectively thinking in terms of you know was the policy good or bad and so on. Health benefits and costs of uh, uh, cannabis use. Uh, again, we have plenty of research, but they are not really, um, you know, helpful in terms of reaching a very specific conclusion. Um, again, broadly, if you think in terms of benefits, cannabis users, they think, uh, you know, using cannabis makes them happy. It helps them relax, enjoy food, enjoy life in general. And, you know, medical cannabis, most of them, if you ask them, they say they take it for pain management, but we don't have much clinical evidence showing that, you know, the cannabis really helps them to reduce pain. So overall, um, if you think about, you know, the health benefits and costs, um, uh, the, the chemical in cannabis, the tetrahydrocannabinol, causes more harm than good to one's health. And that's based on clinical research. And they have what's called this number needed to treat, a term, a concept in uh, medicine. And uh, for cannabis, you need 24 people to use cannabis for one person to benefit. And the number needed for the drug to harm people it's, you know, if you, if, you, if you give it to six people, one will definitely show a side effect. So this is, again, clinical evidence showing that the THC, the drug in cannabis, causes more harm than good. So uh, having said that, I'm going to actually uh, get into the computations of uh, benefits at the county level, and then we will look at the costs. Now, uh, if you go to uh, the CannabisIllinois.gov, the website, you can actually download data in terms of uh, sales, monthly sales of cannabis products, both medical and also recreational cannabis. And it's at the state level. And if you look into this graph, you will see that we legalized uh, recreational cannabis in 2020. And up till now, 2023, the growth rate has been like, you know, about 20% per year. Um, and if you, again, you know, see the graph, the graph is uh, so-called hitting a ceiling. Uh, that means you need to have more new users to increase sales further than, say, $2 billion. So we are hitting a ceiling, roughly around $2 billion. Now, um, the problem is we don't have county level data on cannabis tax revenues. Why? We have you know, state uh, revenues, uh, tax revenues listed on the website. But for county level data, we need to go into, for example, controller's office, uh, the website, and then uh, look into financial reports and data. I did that, and this is an example of Knox County. And if you look at Knox County revenues, you can see, you know, in here, property taxes here. I have even property tax in there. And then you will also have, um, you know, other items such as, you know, sorry, um, uh, let me go up. 
other items like, for example, charges for services and then transit utilities and refuse and disposable charges and so on. But you don't have anything to do with cannabis. And I think it's all combined in here in the other category. And I actually went in and looked at the audit reports and also the submissions from the county for explanations, but I couldn't really find anything uh, to do with uh, cannabis taxes, uh, uh, you know, uh, listed in the financial reports. So we have to estimate. And most of the county's financial reports, they don't have a specific item for cannabis taxes. So we have to estimate and then we have to start thinking in terms of uh, costs and benefits and benefits and costs analysis and so on. So how did I estimate that? I actually, um, you know, used four different types of data to come up with county level estimates of uh, you know tax revenues. And step by step, first I went into the cannabisillinois.gov the website, you know, the cannabis regulation oversight officer's website and downloaded monthly sales data at the state level for 2023. And then I went into my tax Illinois to get the cannabis tax rates for each of the 102 counties. And then I also sourced population data, uh, 21 plus, because it's adult uh, use cannabis, and also the usage rate, uh, the population data from uh, American Community Survey and the usage rate from uh, National uh, Survey on Drug Use and Health. So I used four different data sets to estimate uh, uh, revenues, cannabis tax revenues for counties. And again, a simple example, if you go into cannabis.illinois.gov, the website, you can actually download monthly sales data for the state, uh, you know, by use category, like adult and recreational use and medical use and so on. So when I went up there like a week ago, they had uh, up till August uh, data figures, sales figures. So I actually used uh, a simple computation and, um, um, you know, growth rate and um, projected for September to December, the sales. So we have data for 2023, uh, you know, up to December, again, estimates for September, October, November, and December. And then I went into the mytax.illinois.gov website to uh, get data on uh, tax rates. Um, you know, again, I have uh, McDonough County as an example. They uh, impose 11.75% uh, tax on uh, uh, adult use cannabis. And uh, in a couple of more examples, Metro uh, County, Alexandra County, it's 10%. Uh, and for bond, it's 11%. And same for uh, non-Metro, a couple of examples, Adams, 10.25, Brown, 11.25. Um, and then uh, to obtain county population, I went into uh, American Community Survey 2017 to 2021 for your estimates and uh, downloaded population numbers. And again, I have given a few examples. Remember, I have to estimate uh, uh, tax revenues at the county level. So I need data on state sales, then tax rates at the county level. Then I need population numbers. Then I need their usage rate, cannabis usage rate. And that's what I did um, from uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 2021 numbers. Um, and there is an interesting pattern in here. First, I need to tell you what I mean by current user and also daily user. Daily user, you know, it's, it's very obvious. That means the person uses uh, cannabis every day. Current user, we defined it as uh, a person who um, uses the, the the cannabis product, uh, you know, it could be um, an e-cigarette, it could be a candy, you know, they have uh, chocolates and they also have lemonade infused with uh, uh, THC and so on. So any use. So current user is a person using it for uh, minimum of, uh, not minimum, minimum of one and maximum of 19 days. So less than 20 days in a month. So we classify that person as a current user. And daily user is, of course, the person uses cannabis products every day. Um, and if you look at, look at these numbers, 
in the metro region, uh, the current user, you have 0.57, for example, uh, for medical and non-medical or adult use or recreational use is 0.52. Um, you know, these are the proportion of people using it. And in the non-metro, it's, it's only 40% or so. But if you think in terms of daily user, then uh, it's reversed the trend. The usage is much higher in the non-metro, almost 60%. In the non-metro, they uh, use it daily, um, you know. And again, this is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, the the thing is, the survey was fielded during 2021, so they collect data at the national level, and you need to mine through micro data to come up with the metro non-metro classification. So you have like 86,000 records and you have thousands of variables. So you need to mine that and get the number and information. So we did that. So we have combined four different data sets and you know, the equation in, you know, in, in, in a simple way, I have put that in, uh, but it's essentially you have your uh, sales, you have your you know, state sales, county tax rate, and then you have the county population, and then the use rate, and you combine them, and the product would be the tax revenue for uh, the county. So we estimated this for each of the 102 counties. And so, you know, we have tax revenues, and we call that as a benefit of uh, the adult use cannabis, you know, the legalization. And there are some examples. If you think in terms of average for metro counties, the tax revenue is almost like a million dollars for 2023. Again, it's an estimate. And the good news is, you know, they released the September sales figure. And then I compared my projection with the actual sales data that we have online. And, you know, it's, it's almost like a perfect match. So I'm happy with the model that we have used to project the, the 2023 uh, tax revenues for counties. But anyway, coming back to this, the median or the average, uh, the typical earnings would be a million dollars for a metro county. And again, it differs. Cook County, you know, they take in $85 million. They'll be taking in $85 million in 2023. Alexander, the smallest county, metro county, you know, they get around $70,000 in tax revenues. And in Non-metro, uh, the meat value of the tax revenue is around $200,000. And LaSalle County, uh, they take in 1.4. They'll be taking in 1.4 million this year. And Pope County, which is the smallest one, you know, $34,000 uh, in tax revenues. So again, if you go back to the equation, I said you have value. That means you assess the value of uh, legalizing recreational cannabis in Illinois. Um, you know, that can be captured um, by using benefits and costs, benefits uh, over costs. So the quotient should be greater than one. So we have the benefits now. And the benefits are, uh, again, roughly $1 million dollars for Metro County on average and $210,000 for non-Metro. Now, we are going to actually think in terms of costs. Uh, and again, I have um, used health impacts to come up with the costs. Um, and again, uh, we made use of the National uh, Survey on Drug Use and Health to come up with uh, the cost estimates. Um, and how did I do that? You know, I started with this uh, item, which is like, you know, they ask the, the survey population or the sample. And of course, they projected to the population that they have ever used marijuana. And if you think in terms of metro and non-metro, it's 46% uh, for metro and non-metro is much uh, lower. It's 42%. The, the thing is, uh, clinical research uh, shows that, you know, if a person uh, tried marijuana, and the probability of the person becoming addicted to marijuana is 0.1, which means 10 percentage of the population population that have ever used marijuana will uh, get addicted to the drug uh, THC. Um, and again, uh, you know, some of the demographics, the the profile of people who use. Um, this is astonishing. Median age for Metro is 17. 
for non-metro, it's 16. Um, um, you know, um, uh, again, you know, it's available, even though it's for adult use cannabis, you know, people, you know, teenagers can buy from online retailers. And, you know, most of the online retailers, based on the research that we did a few months ago, I know that they don't really ask for, you know, a ID, strict ID uh, is not really enforced, you know, to buy cannabis. They take um, a cash, they take gift cards and everything, you know, so people do have access, but this is the median age. And in terms of broader profile, of course, men tend to use um, uh, cannabis more than women. And in terms of race in the metro, it's the whites. In the non-metro, again, uh, it was um, uh, a bit uh, kind of uh, uh, new to me because it's the other race in non-metro. That means it's, uh, you know, Pacific Islanders uh, um, uh, and Asians and so on. They tend to use more. Um, uh, you know, um, again, there was a bit of a kind of a, uh, anomaly. That's what I thought. So I went in and rechecked, and but still, it's the minority, um, the race. You know, the other race that um, uh, have you know again the profile of uh, a typical ever used person. Employment status: unemployed tend to use more, and in terms of income, family income. Uh, you know, we can actually simply summarize it using a principle. If you are rich, then you don't really use marijuana. So that's a profile. Now, I wanted to see how 2021 data compared to the pre-legalization, that is, you know, 2018, for example. And then this is the result. Um, and again, you know, post-legalization 2020, uh, both men and women, tend to uh, use more. Um, and if you think in terms of non-metro, the women tend to um, uh, take that up. Um, uh, um, again, uh, a larger proportion of women. And in terms of um, race, and again, in the non-metro, it's the other race uh, that's, that's taken up um, marijuana. Um, and uh, unemployment, um, is one factor um, that results in marijuana use and same thing with family income. So but, uh, if you, you know, roughly think about, you know, 2018, that was pre-legalization and 2021 post-legalization, what's happening, we do have increases in terms of cannabis use. Now, the disorder, again, based on empirical research, meta-analysis and so on, an average annual per person cost, um, you know, to to treat a person uh, with uh, cannabis use disorder is around seventeen hundred dollars. So we took that number and we went into the population data and came up with cost distribution. Again, you know, we have costs distributed across the one or two counties. And this is an example in terms of non-metro. Um, and um, uh, again, um, you know, the, 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 the specifics are in the paper. I have actually given actual cost estimates for each of those counties. I just wanna point out that, um, you know, some of these counties um, that have, have um, uh, kind of uh, high costs um, for, um, you know, treating people with cannabis use disorder. Um, and then we started thinking in terms of the value equation itself, the quotient of benefits or costs. So Metro 14 counties, you know, they're not going to gain any value from recreational cannabis uh, legalization. Um, you know, again, the denominator, which would be the cost, they are more than the numerator tax revenues. Grundy County in Metro, it's the worst. And in terms of non-Metro, again, um, you know, you have 16 counties uh, out of 62, which is roughly one in three. Um, yeah, roughly, approximately. Uh, 
they don't actually gain any value. They will not gain value from uh, recreational cannabis legalization in 2023. Coles County has the worst score and Brown County has the best score. But, um, you know, uh, again, uh, if you think about the typical value uh, the median value is is of value is 1.15. So 50% of the counties, they are doing better. They are gaining some value, but you have 16 counties not gaining any value at all. Again, these are based on estimates of benefits. Uh, you know, the benefits are the, the tax revenues and costs, which are, uh, you know, treatment costs. To you to treat people with cannabis use disorder. Implications: You need data. We don't have much data. You know, we have national level data, and again, you need to uh, mine the data properly to get into the numbers, and then start thinking in terms of you know generalizing the data, the national survey data, to the state level, and then we need to estimate everything from you know, costs, healthcare costs, and so on. So we need data. We don't have data. And another thing is, um, you know, um, the denominator of the value equation, the cause, I use only healthcare costs, but we also have other elements of costs like, you know, um, motor vehicle accidents, mental issues, and so on. We don't have data. Again, we couldn't estimate those costs. But the, the critical thing is data may not help us to... Um, really, um, you know, we can have the benefits cost and we can actually get more realistic picture in terms of the cost. But, you know, the industry is so powerful, it's becoming more powerful day by day. It has created 30,000 new jobs. And so it'll be difficult to pull them back or regulate, uh, you know, the the, the cannabis industry Um thinking about, you know, public well-being and so on. So uh, that's my uh, quick 20 minutes uh, uh, summary. And again, if you need the paper, all you have to do is, you know, the, the paper that discusses all those costs and benefits, county-wise estimates and so on, everything is there. And you can download this as a PDF version. And if you have any specific questions, please email me and I will, um, um, you know, respond. Um, and yeah, so that's the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to remind everyone um, to put their questions in the chat space if they have questions. Um, and, you know, maybe I can start you off with one question, Dr. Tyman. You have done some um, studies that are not just statewide, but with certain counties. Um, did you notice anything in particular um, in regards to trends in certain parts of the state? And what do you think was sort of um, provocative in your mind uh, that... Uh, in regards to maybe some economic potential or policy um, implication. Okay, um, thanks, Nancy. Um, the uh, if you if you go back to the initial slides that I had, uh, the one to do with sales, I mentioned that the sales have hit the ceiling. In a sense, you know, my estimates are we are going to actually see only two billion dollars sales. That's the maximum. If the industry wants to increase sales, then they need to attract new users. So, you know, so that's what it is. You know, new users may become regular users and then the industry will benefit. So 2 billion is the ceiling. And to break the ceiling, the industry has to recruit new users. Um, so marketing is a, is a huge um, um, uh, issue. Um, and, um, um, you know, um, my experience um, with specific counties, and I do see lots of youngsters getting access to um, cannabis because the products, if you um, look at the products that they have, it's not just only the e-cigarettes, but also candies, chocolates, and um, um, 
um, you know, uh, drinks uh, infused with uh, THC. So that's a huge issue. So marketing has to be um, restricted. And even though we say marketing is not allowed, if you go and mine some of those um, um, social media pages, you do see uh, ads creeping in. So that's another issue that has to be addressed. And again, I uh, alluded to, you know, briefly to the uh, online dispensaries. Uh, there are like 80 online dispensaries um, adjacent to us. And some of them, I would say 30 or 40 of them, they don't even ask for ID. Uh, they take all sorts of payments and they ship and you know, and uh, so that's a that's an issue. So policy wise, I think we need to start thinking more in terms of how to regulate uh, the marketing. Um, um, and um, um, yeah, so um, I hope I answered everything. You know, I'm trying to actually keep track of what you asked. You asked like a couple of questions. One is to do with um, um, my um, experience in terms of county trends. Um, and the trend is like what I said, you know, to summarize, it's uh, it's at the maximum level now. It hits the, you know, it's it, it has hit the ceiling. So, you know, they need to recruit new users. And so we have to be very careful in terms of the industry marketing. Um, and when you say it you hits know, the ceiling, do you mean market saturation? Market saturation, yeah. Market, I would say, you know, the market potential is there. So the, 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 it's, 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 it's not the, um, you know, there are two things in here. You have the market potential. Potential would be every person in Illinois using cannabis. That's the potential. Then you have the market demand. The demand is now flat at 2 billion. That's what I'm saying. So if you want to increase and then bridge this demand and then, you know, potential, um, minus market demand you have lots of demand you know which is unexploited market potential so if you want to reach that then you need to recruit new users that's what i'm saying sure and and you know that reminds me in terms of new uses and uh, new users and new uses um we did kind of touch on the the different uses uh in the industry cons uh discussion for the first webinar um i think if folks want to revisit that 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 was really interesting, uh, surprising all of the other different types of products that, that could be um, yeah. developed uh, using hemp. And um, so, but yes, the, the loaded question was intentional, but I thought it was interesting when you mentioned that, um, the, you know, we have those online sales uh, with the shipping and whatnot. Do you have any idea what sort of, um, revenue is not being tapped into due to that issue? Very good question. The problem is, again, we need to estimate, um, you know, based on um, um, the proportion of um, people. Um, there are two things in here. One is um, people don't want to admit that they are buying this online uh, from other states and so on. So, um, you know, we need to actually have, uh, that's why I said we need data data naturally in terms of um, you know how it's uh, how it has impacted post legalization in cannabis use in the county and also data um, in terms of um, you know um, how people buy online which we can find out but we need what's called as observations it's not based on questionnaire surveys and so on you know people are not going to actually answer that so we need to observe um, you know, uh, I remember um, in Australia, we did a study uh, um, looking at um, the, you know, for a museum, uh, the wear of the tiles to really say, okay, this display is the one that attracts the most uh, crowd and so oh, on. So you need to actually move beyond surveys and start observing, um, you know, and, and, and that's based on, again, uh, one-to-one um, -one, um, uh, depth interviews, and then we need to uncover uh, those things. You know, so that's why data are lacking, and we need to spend money to gather information and to gain more insights into the issue. 
Thanks. And I know I kind of cut in line there with my question a little bit. I do that sometimes on these. And, um, but I do want to give uh, Chris a, a chance to um, give any comments or questions as well and um, perhaps um, uh, drive any discussion as well. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nancy. There's actually a couple of questions um, in the chat. And uh, uh, Kevin Bessler asks, what action could a county take if their costs are more than their tax benefits? Um, good question. Um, the only way to reduce cost is to reduce the number of people trying cannabis. Remember, the probability is 0.1. So if a person tries cannabis and the chance of the person uh, becoming addicted to cannabis is 0.1, that means 10 percentage of your users will become addicted and they have to be treated. You know, And again, the cost, I just actually estimated an average annual cost to treat a patient is $1,700. I did not take into account emergency room visits because of overdoses. And also I haven't taken into account other impacts like you know um, driving under influence and so on. So um, so you know the 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 behavior, the the trying behavior should be stopped. That means education. Um, and education uh, at a very young age, starting from, uh, um, you know, I would say junior high, um, and then tell them what the, um, you know, the costs are in terms of health uh, using THC products and so on. So education is a must. And the only way to reduce costs would be to stop people from using it. And, you know, otherwise we do have... Uh, this um, kind of uh, issue that 10 percentage of, you know, um, people who try will become addicted and we need to treat them. Uh, thanks. Uh, another question, D.L. Gallagher asks, uh, how did you keep separate the treatment costs of THC versus other types of substance abuse? Yeah, good question. Um, if you go into... Um, um, the, the literature, um, you know, the the JAMA, the, the American Medical Association publications and so on, they have listed cause for uh, cannabis use disorder. And then they also have cause for, you know, treating um, 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 other substances, uh, you know, substance use disorders, like for example, alcohol and so on. So. Um, this is based on a meta-analysis. So what they do is they combine several studies uh, that have addressed cost issues um, by um, use disorders. You know, when you when you when you think in terms of drugs, and then they have um, averaged uh, the cost and come up with uh, a number. And that number is what I have used. Uh, actually, I actually updated that number a bit using uh, CPI and so on because it was a 2016, no, 2018 number. So I updated that. But, you know, essentially what we should do is think in terms of uh, low level and high level costs and use interval estimates rather than point estimates to come up with uh, cost calculations. But I used a point estimate because, um, you know, it's it's already been um, subjected to um, several um, um, uh, kind of adjustments and so on. So, you know, so um, again, um, the, the source is uh, American Medical Association and they have uh, costs uh, um, per uh, person cost for several uh, drug use disorders. And I took the cannabis one and used it as an estimate. Um. Oh, Gary, uh, thank, uh, thanks. Uh, Gary Kensel from SIU Carbondale asks, how does the addiction rate of 10% compare to that of alcohol use? More broadly, how does the cost-benefit analysis compare to that of alcohol use? Alcohol addiction is much more. I can tell you that. Um, and alcohol um, uh, costs would be much more treatment and so on. Um, the, 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 the thing is, there is a huge correlation between family income and cannabis use. If you think in terms of cannabis, then it's it's more skewed towards low income 
families. If you think in terms of alcohol, it's spread across and high income is highly associated with um, alcohol use. Um, you know, so the cost of treatment, I don't remember the number exactly, but that's uh, much more, uh, I would say $500 or $600 more. Uh, again, I, I forget, I don't, I don't recall. Um, but um, yeah, so um, this, the, the cost, um, again, for alcohol, um, um, uh, use disorder, you know, treating the alcohol use disorder is slightly higher than cannabis. And, um, I mentioned about the correlations in terms of income. Um, um, and, um, yeah, so I forget the question. What was the question, Chris? Sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, just, I guess, uh, how does the cost benefit analysis compare to that of alcohol? So in other words, well, yeah, so you yeah. Yeah, so I think I addressed it. You know, we didn't really do a cost benefit analysis for alcohol, but uh, the per person treatment rate is much higher. Uh, I wouldn't say much higher, a bit higher, six hundred dollars or so. Again, I don't remember the exact number. Um, and again, the correlation I mentioned that you know you have um, um, correlation with low income families and cannabis use, whereas for alcohol, it's it's almost the um, sorry, yeah, it's, it's almost the other way around. You have um, a higher correlation with income. Hmm. I have a, so related. Uh, there's a couple more questions uh, before I move on to those. I had one more question comparing alcohol and uh, marijuana use. Um, you know, my sense is, and, and this could be wrong, but it seems like it it might be easier to measure the tax implications of alcohol sales and the economic costs and benefits of alcohol sales versus marijuana, you had to sort of drill down deep into multiple data sets, make estimations and so forth. And it seemed like it was a very sort of arduous task to make any, to make sense of cannabis tax revenue impacts. Um, is that, is, is my perception correct there that, that for some reason it's, it's, it's more of a challenge to measure the the marijuana impacts, um, it is. You know, um, again, it's because um, uh, it's you know if you think in terms of the state, uh, Illinois, you know, twenty twenty we legalized it, and we don't have much data. So all we can do is go into national uh, survey on drug use and health because they measure alcohol use, cannabis use, uh, you know, smoking and everything. Mm -hmm. We did a uh, paper on e-cigarettes. And then we had the same issue in terms of, you know, again, people who are interested in e-cigarettes use and profile of users and costs and benefits and so on can download the paper from the IARA website. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, data are a problem. We don't have data. So, you know, and again, uh, some of those things are really, you know, socially uh, um it's like a taboo, you know, you don't really say that, yeah, I smoke, um, um, uh, you know, I vape cannabis and so on. So that's another issue, collecting data and so on. Um, but alcohol, um, uh, of course, cigarettes would be the top revenue um, maker in terms of, you know, taxes and so on, and then alcohol and then cannabis. Um, uh, the data of, for, for alcohol is a bit easier. But for cannabis, you need to actually go in and, and um, make certain assumptions and then combine data sets and then gain insights mm. into who is using and what's the implication and so on. Mm. But I can tell you, as far as I uh, can recall, um, um, this is the first attempt in terms of coming up with the cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. at county level. So, you know, so uh, we have done something and hopefully uh, people will build on that and, uh, you know, make it better in terms of measures and so on. Right. Uh, I just, it seems like much was made of the potential benefits of the cannabis sales. And so one would have maybe speculated at least that um, reporting would have been um, more transparent, if you will, so that we could see those benefits. Uh, but anyway, thanks to you, you've kind of done the, yeah, and the again, hard work for us. Uh, no, no problem at all. But again, uh, uh, Chris, you know, if you think in terms of the value equation, the benefits, I used only the cannabis tax rates as the benefit. And we also have other benefits like, you know, the incarceration rate, because of cannabis, you know, that's a benefit that, that may have gone down. I haven't looked at numbers, but I still see lots of minority 
being incarcerated, uh, not for cannabis, for other reasons and so on. So, um, yeah, so that's a benefit that we could add. And that means we need to actually start thinking in terms of, again, pre legalization, post legalization, gather data, and then estimate um, cost savings and use it as a benefit for the numerator. But the denominator, again, the cost, we used only this uh, cannabis use disorder treatment costs. There are other costs included. And so if you include that, the denominator is going to go up in value. And same thing with the numerator. And, you know, um, uh, you know again, we need to actually expand this. We have built a base and we know that based on just this healthcare costs and also the tax, it's not really creating value. So mm -hmm. if we expand this equation to include more elements, more components for benefits and costs, then we could get a different picture. But my thinking is it's not going to make much of a difference. You know, even if you include um, benefits such as, you know, reduced incarceration rate and so on, still the costs are going to creep up and we're going to actually end up with um, questioning the value of recreational cannabis legalization. Mm. Uh, a couple of questions related to tax rates. And I was surprised to see um, a little bit of variation uh, county by county to the way that medical, first of all, uh, medical uh, marijuana tax at a much lower rate than recreational. And then even comparing one county to another at the recreational level, there was some some variation. Um, and then uh, uh, one of the other questions was, uh, so if you could say something about the variation at the county level about tax rates. And then somebody asked about um, home, uh, home use people. One could imagine people growing at home uh, who are using it, there could be a cost there, but there's no tax revenue generated from, from home use as well. So there's a couple of yeah. questions related to taxes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, we haven't actually, we have started this process. We have used, uh, you know, a few indicators to measure benefits and costs, but there are multiple other components to, uh, you know, both costs and benefits, and we have to include that. But again, data it's a huge issue. You know, we don't have much data. So once we, um, um, you know, and, and I'm hoping that we'll have some uh, um, uh, systematic efforts made towards collecting, gathering data to address some of these research questions and issues. Yeah. Uh, Nancy asks another question. Um, what new ideas on taxing or to sales diversifying use do you think would be helpful to not only cover societal costs, uh, but maybe also generate more revenue. Yeah, see, um, most of the people, you know, um, they want to use it, so they will buy. So, you know, but the problem is you also have um, a low income uh, correlated with um, cannabis use. So if you keep increasing costs, then you're going to actually end up buying uh, illegally hmm. uh, in the street. You know, so... That's an issue, you know, and, and that's lost, lost in, mm -hmm. uh, at a huge proportion. And also you have other problems that will crop up, you know, more crime because they won't actually buy um, legal um, um, cannabis. That means they need more money. That means, you know, petty thefts and, and everything will crop up. So all those issues have to be sorted out. Yeah. Now, you didn't actually report on this, but I did as you're uh going through your slides, I a question arose in my mind. If you think in general, uh, rural counties have a higher tax rate for recreational marijuana use or purchase than urban, I, I'm just wondering if there's a trend one way or the other, uh, level of tax rate versus uh, urban versus rural. Yeah, the again, in, uh, in my paper appendix one, I have listed all the tax rates for, for each of the 102 counties, and I have listed the median and so on. Um, from memory, um, I think uh, non-metro uh, is higher. It's higher. Okay, that's from interesting. Memory. I have to yeah. check yeah. yeah, so I have to check my uh, um, my numbers, but from memory. Um, and what was the next question, Chris? You said the tax, and the second one was um, whether 
we could increase or so is that what you asked or i know i mean that's that's the great i just sort of wondering you know in general okay uh, so i would have guessed that yeah. urban would have i would have hypothesized that, that, it's, that in the, metro it's in the paper i have actually, yeah um Say, for example, Adams County, you know, they have, uh, or McDonough County, they have 11.1%, um, you know, so they can, county can actually tax 3.75%. And of course, the state 625 And then they also have other uh, kind of taxes, like for education and for, um, you know, healthcare and so on. So they added some of those taxes. So uh, it's a bit higher, 11.25, I think, for Adams. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, um, again, Appendix 1 uh, in the paper, it has all the tax details. And I also have um, the revenue, tax revenue estimates county-wise and also mm. cost county-wise. So all the numbers are there. And I also given the quotient, the value equation, what the results are for counties. So everything is in there. Um, and again, to summarize, it's the start. You know, we assess the value. And uh, even with, um, um, you know, the the... the the, the thing is that people always think that this is bringing in lots of revenue, and so this is very beneficial. But when you start thinking objectively and start factoring in costs, and then you will see that the net value is not there, you know, at least for mm -hmm. some companies. And, you know, they need to, um, um, again, uh, if you take the clinical viewpoint and think in terms of uh, THC, the, the drug, doing more harm than good, then you need to start thinking about uh, what's the value. So if the policy is really, um, you know, um, looking at the well-being of the population. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just okay. checking, the, uh, checking the chat. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, can, can you hear me now? Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 no, it's good. Yeah, um, I was uh, just checking the chat. Um, I didn't see any other questions there, and um, you've sort of covered all of my questions. Um, I, I think at this point, um, I'm just going to say thank you again. I appreciate the work you've been doing um, on hemp and cannabis and marijuana use. It's been very enlightening, and um, I'm just going to hand it back to Nancy uh, for her concluding remarks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a really great conclusion to our three-part series on hemp and cannabis in the Prairie State. Um, you know, it's uh, it's been very important to look at what is going on in the industry, and we had that discussion on, on our first uh, webinar, and um, also in terms of state and local policies and revenues. And we're just very grateful to you, uh, Dr. Timon, as well as all of our presenters during the series. And we hope that uh, you know folks will revisit this material to gain knowledge of what is and what could be um, in Illinois for this aspect of our economy. And as Chris says, it's been very enlightening. So um, also just wanna thank Rural Partners and Illinois Institute for Rural Affairs, the Illinois Department of Agriculture and all those that made this program possible. Uh, we'll see you next time and hope that everyone has a great rest of their week. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.